Okay, so I think we can start now. Um, so uh, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Sayed. I work as a senior software engineer at, uh, and apart from uh, my professional work, I am also a community evangelist uh, and open source enthusiast. I'm, I've been dabbling around uh, multiple open source communities for the past decade. Um, that includes uh, Fedora, as well as a few other open source communities out there. And yeah, this is a topic that is very near and dear to me, and also one that uh, I've been working with a few other folks in Red Hat and in developing. Um, so yeah, I'll be uh, talking about uh, leading and growing an open source community. And uh, probably uh, by the end of the, uh, the session, I would be able to share, <clears throat> like uh, maybe this will be really helpful for some people out there who attend this. So uh, let's get on to it. Uh, so what is an open source uh, project and uh, community leadership in general, right? So this is a question that comes up a lot uh, and surprising are not uh, really uh, clear about this. So as contributors uh, to a project become more familiar with how the project works, they may uh, at times wish to become more active in helping the community grow. And ultimately, uh, this usually means that they'll be taking on more responsibilities in that project. Uh, today, uh, the idea is that we'll be discussing this uh, in more details, what it means, uh, that is, uh, what does it mean to lead an open source project and our community. Uh, the fact uh, that contributing uh, to an open source project and uh, leading in that project are two different modes of engaging with that uh, project uh, is something that we will be exploring a bit more. And uh, yeah, let me, let me, uh, explain why uh, so as a contributor uh, when uh, you inc when you want to assume increased responsibilities and as a contributor to an open source software project uh, your duties to the project may be more or less uh, straightforward uh, things like fix bugs answer questions in the project's communication channels and etc there, there can be a lot of things that you can do uh, but when assuming a position of leadership in the project, your role becomes more comprehensive. Uh, you may drive technical direction, begin speaking with authority for the project in uh, public venues, such as conferences like this one, um, initiate programs to recruit or more project members, and even at times like change the projects, processes and policies. Uh, so in short, you, you are now assuming more uh, responsibilities for a project's success or failures and that becomes a core part of your role so the question that comes up next is why do it why take on responsibility for a project and community success um, and there are many answers to this reason uh, there are many answers to this so the reasons might uh, range from organizational needs to your personal fulfillment. Uh, so as you consider taking on a leadership position in the project, uh, like maybe take some time to think about uh, your motivations for doing so. Uh, maybe having a good understanding of uh, why you want to lead will help you choose the best places for your, uh, for you to apply your skills uh, and maybe also your interests within the project. Uh, it can be anything. It can be like a conflict resolution or better issue triaging processes, uh, which can make help you to make sure that uh, users are getting help more quickly. Uh, and frankly, it's no secret that leading an open source project has many tangible benefits. Uh, some of these are already listed here, but when it comes to seeking employment uh, and also in your personal uh, careers, you know, it provides a sense of personal fulfillment. Um, many individuals usually choose a leadership position for the simple reason that they, they, they appreciate their social connections in the project's community and want to be of greater service to others in the community. They want to have a higher impact within the community. So this was kind of a round off of what, where we want to go with the session today. Um, and uh, let's let's probably uh, look at our goals for the, today's session. 
Um, so in this uh, presentation, we will explore uh, leadership in open source projects, uh, the responsibilities leaders have, the transition pathways uh, from a contributor to a leader, uh, and some ways in which excellent leaders can help their projects avoid common social challenges. Uh, broadly, our goals for the day are to understand uh, common challenges associated with expanding, maintaining, uh, and popularizing an open source project, uh, exploring new steps, uh, exploring steps that uh, new community leaders can take to begin addressing those challenges, and identifying steps leaders can take to achieve project success. Uh, before we start, one additional note here. I cannot uh, guarantee that you will probably leave our time together today uh, equipped with everything that you could possibly need to know about uh, be being a project leader or a community leader because every project is different. And I don't, I, I frankly don't know every bit of advice that can help you lead each of these different individual projects. Uh, at the end, it's up to you. Like you will need to translate this advice into your own context. So, what we are going to do today is uh, we would be examining the most common avenues for meeting the challenges uh, new leaders face and uh, general pathways uh, for getting started. Uh, that not just me, but a lot of people uh, who have a lot of experience within. Uh, open source communities in general have found to be the most fruitful for them. So in many cases, we have uh, uh, a lot of other components and uh, a lot of other, uh, let's say, topics that we can talk about. But for now, for the purposes of this session, uh, maybe let's stick to the, the overview that I just shared. So uh, we we'll begin by stressing that anyone uh, interested in assuming a leadership a role uh, in a community driven project will need to begin asking three fundamental uh, questions about that project uh, this include like how will you expand the project maintain the project and popularize the project so what do these questions mean so how can uh, we would be actually uh, exploring how can you expand the project, uh, that is, add contributors and increase participation in the project, maintain the project, uh, that is, ensure that your growth is sustainable and that the project stays uh, on course on the pursuit of its uh, mission and vision. Uh, and how can you popularize the project, that is, how can you increase the project's visibility make it an appealing destination for your users and contributors and keep it relevant in an ever-growing ecosystem. So the remainder of our session today, we will focus on each of these uh, three questions. So let's begin um, with the, the challenge of expanding the community, that is uh, increasing community participation and contribution. So I would be like throughout the session, I'd be uh, highlighting some of the common challenges that we face in uh, with each of these aspects and uh, talking about these challenges. They can be social challenges or they can be technical challenges. Uh, so coming back uh, to this slide, uh, we'll be talking about the social challenges. So one of the biggest uh, factors, the, one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people face in this aspect is undocumented insider information or maybe folk wisdom. So excessive and undocumented insider information or what we call folk wisdom uh, at times makes newcomers lacking context and feel excluded. You know, I think most of us have been in that situation wherein we try to con contribute to a new project. We go in there and we find ourselves confused by what a lot of people over there are talking. They are probably using a lot of community jargon that we don't understand. And the problem is because we don't have that insider information uh, when we start, it becomes difficult uh, to contribute to that. Uh, the next thing is unwelcome social dynamics. So, and this is a very important point, like how welcome do we feel new contributors like how welcome do we make new contributors feel uh, perhaps uh, like the project might not be as inclusive as it, as it could be perhaps there are a lot of places a lot of uh, points which we could focus on to improve the project's social dynamics 
right? Uh, then the, there comes the issue of undifferentiated contributor base, right? Uh, communities lacking a diverse contributor base may not seem welcoming to newcomers, especially those from underrepresented groups, maybe. Uh, we mean diversity along all of these axes when we talk about uh, an undifferentiated contributor base. Uh, and we, while we talk about diversity, it's not just about uh, diversity in any one particular section, but rather diversity in the types of skill sets, maybe uh, vendor diversity, number of industries uh, that are represented within this contribute uh, within this community, uh, gender diversity, racial diversity, geographic diversity, like you name it, and there, there are a lot of places where we can talk about diversity. Um, and when working to grow on your community, it if it appears that the community is not only comprised of the it should not look like that the community is com comprised of only one type of contributor uh, people who are not like the existing contributor base might feel like they're not comfortable so that becomes a very uh, big factor when it comes to newcomers to the project uh, then Going along these lines, the next big challenge is uh, language barrier. So communities that communicate in only one language can be really intimidating for those who don't speak that language. And a lot of this can be seen in a lot of major uh, communities out there, uh, especially regional communities. Uh, there, uh, there might be you know, like your project might be based out of a certain country or a certain region uh, wherein most of your contributors are uh, accustomed to talking in one particular language, but if you want to really globalize your project or uh, expand the reach, and if you want to have as many contributors coming into that project as possible, you need to make sure that your potential new contributors don't feel left out because they, they cannot cross that language barrier. And this becomes a very important social challenge. Um, Anyways, uh, let's move on uh, to the next section uh, of challenges. Uh, and these are technical challenges. So th there are a lot of technical challenges that uh, community members uh, feel uh, like come across when they want to start with a new com community. Uh, and this these include a lot of points. Let me take you through each of these points one by one. So lack of clear onboarding and getting started documentation. Uh, surprisingly, this is a very common issue that a lot of newcomers face. A lot of communities don't have a proper clear documentation on ways to get started uh, for newcomers. And this can be a big deterrent for newcomers. Um, <laughs> uh, like aligning contributors with project needs. Uh, again, a big problem that a newcomer might face that, hey, I have certain skills uh, to which I want to contribute, but I cannot understand what the appropriate domain would be uh, for me to contribute within the project. And that becomes a big challenge. Uh, so how do we counteract this? This is, this is a very common uh, issue. And this is something that most uh, community leaders should be aware of. And make a conscious uh, effort to mitigate. Uh, next uh, comes the issue of finding contributors with specific domain knowledge. Uh, finding additional contributors with specific domain knowledge of specialized use cases at times can be really difficult. Uh, you might have people uh, who have domain knowledge of a certain technology, but how do you, how do you map those people to those specific use cases? Um, that, that that at times, again, is a very big technical challenge that a lot of community uh, leaders face. Uh, project code base may, may be directed at a specialized use case. A project may be relatively niche, but locating additional contributors uh, who share its typical use case might be really difficult. Uh, and then there is the challenge of unintended use cases. So your users might be applying a project's uh, software to situations that the project's founders had not initially considered. So in that case, 
the project's founders might be limiting their outreach for the project. How do you tackle that? Uh, this is another uh, com very common uh, technical challenge that the community leaders uh, need to be uh, really aware of and take uh, concrete steps to mitigate. So anyways, uh, with that, uh, let's move on to the next uh, section uh, of, the, of the presentation. So let's talk about contributor pathways. So every project and community uh, will need to address uh, these challenges that we are talking about in ways that, that are most effective for them. However, uh, in general, we suggest uh, beginning to address these challenges by examining your project's contributor pathways, uh, how we will go through them uh, eventually. So opportunities for uh, volunteers begin lending their talent uh, so op the opportunities for volunteers to begin lending their talent uh, to an open source project are called that project's contributor pathways. So uh, the greater the number of project, the contributor pathways your project features, the more likely it is to recruit participants with various skills required for that project's success. So when you're talking of ways to expand your project, focusing on contributor pathways is a great place to begin with. Uh, so let's let's take a look at some of the uh, contributor uh, some of the most common contributor pathways um so before we continue just uh let, let's pause for a second and i just wanted to like like am i going too fast uh i am trying to cover a lot of content over here so i'm trying to i might be going really fast uh, through most of the content of the slides. So if anyone uh, feels that I'm going too fast, just let me know on the chats. I have it open over here. Oh, thank you. So, okay, uh, coming back to the slides again. Uh, first, here are some uh, pathways uh, with a social focus. Uh, things like documenting software and processes, onboarding and mentoring new members, localizing content into various languages, copywriting, managing social media, and organizing events. Um, does your project offer new and existing contributors opportunities to contribute rewardingly to or maybe even take ownership of work in each of these pathways? These, uh, these are uh, things that you should be probably taking a look at. Uh, next, uh, let's examine some pathways with a technical focus. Uh, these include like adding new features and documentation, fixing existing bugs and triaging issues, refactoring existing work to improve it, performing insurance, improving user interface and uh, user experience, release engineering, creating and maintaining project roadmap, code and user interface. Uh, so again, ask yourself, does your project currently offer new and as well as existing contributors opportunities to contribute rewardingly? to or maybe even take ownership of the work in each of these pathways. If not, well, one general way to begin expanding your project is by making a concerted effort to formalize, refine, document, and advertise these contributor pathways. Uh, so yeah, next, let's uh, come to the challenges associated with maintaining a project. So you have a great open source project. Uh, how do you make sure that you can sustain its growth uh, as our expansion efforts exceed? Uh, so again, what are the common challenges that you face? Um, additional infrastructure and overhead, maybe adding additional tooling and infrastructure uh, to your project can create additional work of coordinating participants. Uh, that is basically the time you spend enhancing your project's code. Uh, this might be for smaller leaders uh, who may have to take a lot of work responsibilities for deploying and maintaining these systems, uh, in addition to also coordinating the volunteer work. Uh, the next thing comes to preserving community intimacy. Uh, preserving the intimacy that makes a community so appealing uh, requires more care as the community expands. So. Fewer people may really know one another. And when this happens, the community's social bonds weaken. How do you take care of that? Uh, 
then the, the next uh, big challenge comes to keeping a growing number of participants informed. So as your uh, community grows, keeping all participants informed about the project's developments, it takes up a lot of more time and effort if the community is really large. And that can take up a lot of uh, efforts on the community lead leaders part as well. Um, managing com uh, competing visions for the project. Again, like as the community grows, competing visions for the project may create a uh, contributor tension. So you need to make sure that the vision for the project is always clear and th there are no competing uh, visions uh, because that can be a big challenge, especially to new new contributors it becomes really difficult to understand, okay, how do I go about this as a new contributor if the visions are not clear? Um, architecting and scaling a vision and mission for the project. Um, so a lot of projects uh, begin as personal hobbies and a lot of times they don't have explicitly clear, uh, defined community mission and vision statements. Without this, the project just isn't ready to scale well. So it's very important that you have a very co uh, clear mission and vision statement for your project. So let's talk about governance models. Uh, every project and community will need to have these to address challenges in ways that are the most effective for them. However, uh, in general, we suggest uh, beginning to address these challenges by uh, examining your project's governance models. Uh, what are these governance models? Again, we'll come to them in a little while. So the specific combination of rules and customs that define who gets to do what and also how they're supposed to do it is called a project's governance model. Uh, the better you understand the project's governance model, the greater your chances of successfully helping your project evolve. So as you're looking for ways to help sustain your project's growth and success, uh, it's highly recommended uh, that you begin by examining your project's governance models. Um, so every uh, project has a governance model. Even the ones that say that they don't actually do have a governance model. So uh, let's begin by pinning uh, down some specific details of the way the project is running today. Uh, so. As you can see in this slide, like there's a here's a list of six types of open source governance models. Uh, we don't really have the time now to explore the individual models. However, uh, it's suffice to say that uh, to say here that you know knowing your project is running and who is making the decisions is a perfect way to begin uh, thinking about making the project more sustainable. If the project relies on too few people uh, and if de decisions aren't being made in the most effective way, way then uh, begin by addressing these issues. Uh, so the, the, I just want to uh, clear this on the very onset that uh, the goal of this slide is not to offer a thorough description on the models themselves, but the point is kind of to, you know, set the table for uh, would be community leaders uh, by explaining that a project's governance model should be the first step of the ladder that uh, you need to focus on when playing that plays a very large role in that project. So dimensions of governance. Uh, fundamentally, you will need to begin thinking about the various roles that people play in the community and the various policies and procedures that govern and direct people in these roles. So roles are specific to functions uh, that contributors perform in and for the project. Uh, roles have rights, responsibilities and expectations associated with them. Uh, make sure that these are explicitly documented. Uh, the next thing is policies and procedures. Uh, these are specific rules and processes that uh, direct people in particular roles and define the limits of um, acceptable behavior for the project, its best practices, uh, and other things. So make sure that these are also explicitly documented. Uh, like simply documenting roles, policies, and procedures will uh, go a long way uh, in helping your project become more sustainable. 
Um, finally, uh, let's explore the work of popularizing a project. Uh, how do you increase a project's vis visibility, making it an appealing destination for your users and contributors, and keeping it relevant in an ever-growing ecosystem, right? So again, as before, uh, let's go through the common challenges that uh, people face. So increased com competition for contributors' time, attention, and energy. Uh, competing uh, contributors' time, attention, and energy is more difficult than... <laughs> ever as uh, the number of open source projects increases globally uh, and this is a trend that has been uh, growing over the years uh, 10 years back there were probably not as many open source projects as we have now so the projects nowadays are actually competing with each other for the the time and uh, efforts of those potent of that potential uh, group of people who actually contribute uh, who have a meaningful contribution to that project. Uh, at times, community materials are available in a limited number of languages. So as projects become popular, uh, when uh, when these projects are, they connect with uh, diverse groups of uh, contributors. But often project materials are only uh, available in a limited number of languages. And if your community is probably not communicating, communicating in say English, Many people may not even be aware that it exists. Uh, and this is something that I was also talking about a bit uh, earlier. So yeah, the number of languages that uh, your community's uh, materials are available has a direct impact on your community's uh, number of active contributors. Uh, growing threat of maintainer burnout. As a project becomes more popular, Maintainers might experience burnout when they're trying when they are trying to like keep pace with it. Um, and again, this is also a very real uh, major factor that we see in play uh, with a lot of com communities nowadays. Uh, next, we come to uh, the point of mismatched expectations between enterprise users and hobbyists. So you know. Many uh, popular open source projects are relied upon by really large enterprises, but they are actually maintained by volunteers uh, who are leading to a mismatch of expectations between users and the developer hobbyists. Uh, what happens is uh, users who may expect enterprise uh, great support for these projects uh, might not always get the same. Uh, and this is because these projects are at the end being maintained by developer hobbyists who are working in their spare time. It's not their full time job uh, to take care of these projects, but still they are spending a considerable amount of their time and efforts in maintaining these projects. Um, when people are using the projects for enterprise work, but the software is maintained by hobbyists, there can be an expectations mismatch and that leads to a friction within the community. Um, Proliferation of uh, platforms for user engagement. Uh, finding the best uh, ways to reach your potential users and contributors can be time consuming, uh, given that many people choose to consume information and the users now expect to hear about things on uh, social media and maybe Reddit, Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, whatever, and maybe the tech crunches and so on. So figuring out where to meet people where they are and when you are but uh for a small number of people probably uh it's it's difficult so how do you figure like how do you manage this how do you manage how much proliferation of platforms do you have for user engagement how do you engage these people on so many uh, different platforms right so um yeah Moving on uh, to reward models. So as uh, with the other challenges that we uh, talked about so far, uh, we could discuss many ways to begin addressing popularization challenges. But in general, uh, you know, we have found that focusing on a project's reward models uh, is a great place to begin. Uh, so let's talk, talk about reward models for a bit. So uh, strategies for acknowledging and honoring various contributions to an open source project are called the project's reward models. 
uh, the more uh, models your project constructs, the better it can engage participants with different motivations for contributing to your project. So for example, here are uh, four uh, common reward models, uh, spotlighting community contributors, swag, meet the community features, community awards. So each of these models aims to connect with a certain set of motivations uh, that the participants may have for contributing to a project. Um, everyone uh, contributes to a, a project for a reason. And the most popular projects are those that make contributors feel rewarded, valued, and respected for their contributions. Generating those feelings in contributors is a great way to uh, build your project's reputation and as a rewarding and welcoming place for contributors to uh, put their time and effort in. So let's uh, let's unpack this a bit more, right? Uh, spotlighting community contributions. So using points, badges, uh, we, I think yesterday only we had a lot of sessions on federal badges, right? Uh, leaderboards, uh, charts, and publicly identifying uh, contribution reward party, uh, contributions, uh, they actually uh, reward your participants by visualizing the magnitude of their contributions. It's it's always a great feeling for uh, a contributor to an open source project to know to be able to see uh, their work being highlighted somewhere in a certain way. And this is a great option for connecting with people who tend to value opportunities to show off their technical prowess a bit. It, it always feels nice, right, for the 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 contributors. Uh, next, meet the contributor features. So running blog posts or video series uh, to spotlight contributors uh, reward participants by helping them grow their personal brand and their professional network. Uh, this is a great option for you know connecting with people who see uh, community participation uh, as an opportunity to uh, gain visibility uh, and at times even find uh, work or employment opportunities for themselves. So it's 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 a great platform and it's also a very encouraging platform for newcomers to come and contribute in because they know that at the end of the day if they do some meaningful work their their work gets highlighted and that's a very big uh, motivator for new contributors then uh, there comes the the point of swag who does not like them right like giving contributors various items that uh, signify uh, their affiliation with the community, things like shirts, hats, keychains, like, you know, things like uh, small tokens, like even a mug or something like this. They, they allow the participants to feel a sense of connection with the project. And this is a great option uh, for connecting with people who see community participation as central to their identities, uh, as a fundamental part of their identity building work, right? Uh, and also, it allows them to show off their connection with the community uh, when interacting with other people. Uh, and that makes that membership uh, in the community a part of their own identity. So, yeah. Um, then uh, comes the point about uh, community awards, like allowing community members to like recognize and award others among themselves helps communities uh, to develop shared identities and social bonds and th these bonds are, are really important for any uh, open source or any community in general so this is a great option for connecting with people who uh, see community participation as a way Each other uh, allows them to continually identify and also reinforce shared and communal values and identities. So, yeah. Uh, coming to the next steps. Uh, so this the, there's an overview of uh, the, the the three general kinds of challenges that you're going to face uh, as you assume a leadership role. Uh, that is expanding the community, maintaining the growth sustainably, and popularizing a project along the way. Uh, I can see that we are almost out of time, but let's take a moment to review uh, what might come next for you. Uh, things like gathering community feedback and measuring your success, right? So, uh, first, let's talk about uh, gathering feedback. Uh, leading an open source project uh, means that 
you may, you're making yourself uh, available to address community ideas, uh, concerns, and more. Uh, this feedback uh, it it is very critical to your success, and it's also a measure of uh, how much success that you have, uh, the relative success that you have. And you know you're trying to position yourself as the party who is the most likely to uh, act on community feedback. So you'll need to com continually uh, collect this feedback. Um, so here we have highlighted uh, some of the most common methods for that, uh, and these include open feedback forms. Uh, these are like easily accessible, always on forms for collecting uh, written uh, feedback from your users and contributors. Uh, there are fireside chats. Uh, I don't know how many people over here are familiar with the concept of fire chats or fireside chats, but these are usually uh, these might be pre-recorded or casual interviews with project maintainers or other important leaders who discuss about the project's mission, vision, and strategy. Uh, then there are community calls. Uh, community calls usually are live audio video gatherings uh, where community members get to uh, speak. Uh, like, firstly, they can join and they can speak uh, directly with the project maintainers. And this is uh, these go. This goes a long way in uh, increasing a community's bond as well as clarifying the community's uh, vision and mission strategy. Uh, then there is community Q and A. So these are usually community driven uh, ama or ask me anything style events in which uh, community members submit and vote on questions for the community leaders so yeah and uh, then uh, there is uh, the and then you need to be able to measure the success of your work within the community so depending on your situation this could be important for two reasons one is community, uh, like communicating the success with the community. How will you narrate your uh, community's success um, in achieving its mission and objectives? Uh, you need to be able to uh, help your community measure its progress, chart uh, its accomplishments, and stay focused on those achievements. How will you do that? Um, then there is the challenge of you know communicating success with your organization's uh, stakeholders, how will you explain the value of working with your community to others in your organization? So if you're leading a community because a project is integral to your organization, then you will need to be able to explain the value of your, the work internally too, and that to uh, the organizational stakeholders for your project. So uh, here are like, I'll be talking about a few potential metrics that you might track pertaining to technical contributions. We don't have much time over here, so I won't go into the details of this. But just to give you a general idea, uh, you might attract metrics around code commits, uh, new designs com uh, contributed, uh, the number of issues that have been filed, or maybe the number of code reviews that you have had, uh, how many pull requests have been there to your code base, and so on. Uh, Every project has different uh, like metrics that we, they want to focus on based upon how technical they are or what type of uh, contributor base they have. But in general, these you know, like these are some of the points that you might want to track uh, metrics around your technical contributions. Uh, and again, here are some uh, potential metrics that you might want to track. Uh, pertaining to non-technical contributors. So, uh, you know, gathering feedback and measuring success uh, is really important. And once you have determined how you are going to begin addressing leadership challenges, these will be your next steps. Um, so again, I won't go into the details of any of these points uh, for now, but uh, maybe uh, you can you can explore this with your uh, with other people within your community and based upon that come up with metrics around identifying uh, non-technical contributions and these might include things like you know uh, how many you know, how many people are contributing to your project where those people are based out of um, what, what is the diversity and inclusion statistics for your pro for your project uh, then how many views are there to your co to your community's uh, homepage and so on 
so yeah i think uh, we have covered most of the the topics over here uh, maybe we can summarize uh, all of these uh, in general so yeah so by you know choosing to lead an open source project uh, you can and assume an increased responsibility for that project's success or failure uh, people choose to uh, lead open source projects for various reasons including organizational need uh, a sense of responsibility to the community or uh, personal and professional fulfillment uh, new community leaders face challenges related to expanding maintaining and popularizing their projects and they can begin to address these challenges by examining their projects contributor pathways governance models and reward models and finally, uh, they'll also need to determine the best ways to gather feedback from their communities and communicate the value and success of their work to various stakeholders. So, that, so I think I, I have been able to uh, cover most of the points that I wanted to talk about. And uh, uh, so that's mostly it for uh, the content that I wanted to share with you. Um, and but before ending uh, the presentation, I also wanted to like uh, have an open Q and A session. Probably we have I think another ten minutes. So uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, about the slides or about what I talked about right now, uh, you can probably share them on the chat uh, right now, and I can answer them. Uh, if you have any uh, doubts regarding the projects uh, during the, about the presentation summary. Maybe, yeah, we can talk about that right now. So, yeah, um, and that's it uh, for me for this uh, session. Uh, so I'll, I'm keeping an eye out on the on the session chat. Uh, if anyone has any doubts or any questions that you want to talk about, yeah. I hope I did not go through the slides too fast. Uh, I, I was a bit concerned around uh, the amount of time we have and the amount of content that I wanted to cover through this. Okay, uh, so I think we are done uh, for the day then. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining in uh, on this session. Uh, it was great talking uh, to you. Uh, yeah, and see you around. I am online. If anyone has any uh, doubts, you can ping me directly from the people section. Uh, so yeah, hope it was helpful for you. Yeah. Thank you.